Thank you for watching Scary Bear Attacks. If you like this episode, please remember to hit the like button and leave a comment or two. Then subscribe and click on the bell to receive notifications of whenever we release new videos. Also, please remember to share them to your social media. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us to the Nalchin Public Use Area northwest of Anchorage, Alaska. This part of the state consists of steep mountains covered in fir and pine stands and forests, as well as birch trees, alder, and willow bushes crowding the valley floors. There are hillsides that are covered with shorter bushes as well, but most of the area is forest. The animals here are the typical Alaska fauna, including moose, brown and black bear, as well as an abundance of fur bearers and birds. I was hunting moose in a huge tract of land dedicated to allow people to enjoy the woods. In Alaska, hunters are allowed to hunt moose for sustenance, that is for food. The requirements to harvest are that the moose must be a bull of a specific size or larger. I had been hunting in my secret spot for about eight years. It had been a reliable place to find bull moose that met sustenance hunting minimum size requirements for each of the last eight years. This is no small feat in moose hunting, and this place is what hunters call a honey hole. That means that it is a sweet spot to harvest the target animals. In the fall of 2011, I was doing my normal yearly preparation before heading to my honey hole by float plane. I took careful inventory of my necessities and tracked their weight as I would only have 180 pounds of cargo load to carry on my de Havilland beaver before passing the weight limit. I grabbed the usual equipment, my tent, sleeping bag, guns, ammo, and distinctly recall carefully examining my moose call and being excited about how much meat it had helped me put in the freezer. The next morning I arrived at the small private airport and eagerly walked toward my small plane in the dark. My gear was already loaded the prior day and all I had to do was buckle up and prepare for takeoff. I cranked the engine after completing my pre-flight review and then taxied down the short runway. As I gained speed and approached the end of the runway, my de Havilland beaver lifted off gracefully and away I went. I flew for a little under an hour and saw the Talkeetna River come into view. In stretches of the river it is a steep canyon, which can make for very frightening and riveting wind patterns at times. I followed the river to the point at which it turns west, and I went east, gently landing in remote Stefan Lake. The lake is surrounded by a mix of tundra, bush, and small patches of Sitka spruce. Now Sitka spruce are a particular species of spruce tree which are adapted to the Arctic and subarctic climates, and grow in muskeg areas, and don't usually pass about 5 to 7 feet in height. This area offered tremendous views to observe for my moose. As I unpacked my float plane and tethered it to the shore, I paused to take in the cool October air and the freedom and loneliness that Stefan Lake always gave me. It centered me in many ways and helped me keep perspective on life when I visited. I set up my tent and laid out my bed and sleeping bag and prepared my dinner. After eating dinner and briefly reading my Bible, I decided to get to bed. I was too excited to go to sleep right away and tentatively planned out my hunt for the next day. Uneventfully, consciousness faded and I fell asleep. My alarm startled me awake at 7.30 a.m. It was cold outside of my sleeping bag, and I hurriedly got dressed and put on my stocking cap. I warmed up some oatmeal and sipped my coffee quickly so I could get on the trail as quickly as possible. Then I remembered it wouldn't even get light for another hour. I decided to take advantage of having the time to start hiking toward the meadow that had often been bull moose and many other game animals there in the past. Utilizing my headlamp to light my way, I stumbled and huffed my way along the trail for about an hour and arrived just as the sun peeked over the horizon and light revealed the features of the land. I positioned myself on the high end of the slope so I could see the entire area and relaxed behind my spotting scope. Every hour or so, I would let out a long, low, pitched moan, mimicking a cow moose in heat and looking for a mate. Alternately, I would let out a grunt like, Wah! to mimic a lovesick bull moose in pursuit of a cow. As the day passed, I saw a handful of smaller animals, but none of the usual caribou, nor any moose. It was perplexing, as in the past I had seen at least ten caribou on any given day, and an assortment of sheep or goats as well as moose, but not this day. The next day I hiked to a different site and essentially repeated the same pattern, and this went on for three days. Nothing. I couldn't believe it. On the sixth and final day of my moose hunt, I decided to go down closer to the river, it was a longer hike, but due to the absence of any game near my camp and going home with no meat was not an option, I decided it was worth it. Again, I sought and found a promising stand of willows and alders and began calling. I would wait a few hours in one spot and then move about a mile and repeat the process. Nothing. Finally, I found a flatter area and positioned myself comfortably. I let out several cow calls and a few bull calls. Then I heard it. Not too far away either. Finally, I said to myself, 
I gathered my things and slowly stalked toward the grunt that answered my grunt. I would grunt, and the other bull would grunt in reply. About every five minutes we would exchange grunts, as if we were getting a good idea of where each other were located. I noticed I was moving toward that bull, but he didn't seem to be moving toward me. This is not exactly common, but he was apparently not very confident in his fighting skills. I moved my way through the alders and up over a hill and heard a grunt in return to my latest grunt. As I looked down the hill, I could see a medium-sized muskeg patch, which is an arctic swampy area. In the middle of the muskeg was a stand of short black Sitka spruce that was probably no taller than about five feet toward the middle of the patch, then was shorter toward the edges. The grunt was coming from those Sitka spruce. Using the higher viewing position I had, I set up my observation post and returned a challenge grunt to the lovesick bull. He answered. Then I answered him. He returned the challenge, but did not show himself. This went on for the next hour, neither of us moving, but continuing to challenge each other. Then a spike moose appeared on the far side of the muskeg and lifted his nose into the air. Suddenly he turned tail and ran back through the alders and willows the same way he came. I figured he must have winded me after six days of hiking in the bush, but why didn't the bull in the sitka win me? After another hour of the same grunt exchanging, my patience was worn out and my daylight was just about spent. I decided to stop grunting to see what the bull would do. I waited ten minutes, then twenty minutes passed. He grunted every once in a while, but I would not answer. Another fifteen minutes goes by and I remain silent. After another ten minutes or so, apparently the silence got the best of him, and he had to start investigating where the other bull I was pretending to be had gone. I could see the Sitka start to shake and move as the bull started to emerge. As I stared at the point he would seemingly emerge from, I was suddenly very confused. I saw this giant round face poke out of the Sitkas. Suddenly this giant round face raised up to reveal a gigantic brown bear. The Sitka spruce that surrounded him barely reached the middle of his chest as he stood on his hind legs. According to this comparison, I guessed his height on his hind legs to be at least 10 feet tall. That is when it all came together in my mind. The reason I had not seen even a single animal in the honey hole. The reason he wouldn't move toward me. The reason the small bull on the other side of the muskeg wouldn't come to me. This bear had figured out how to grunt like a bull moose and had grunted his way into wiping out my honey hole of almost all the once plentiful moose. He was using the location of the Sitka spruce stand to conceal himself as the oblivious moose would trudge across the muskeg to him, revealing their approach and slowing their escape. This bear was what we call a ten square bear. In hunting terminology, that means that once you harvest him and remove his hide, it would measure 10 feet from front paw to front paw and then 10 feet from nose to tail. The part that really frightens me is that this bear had somehow learned to mimic the mating grunt of a bull moose in rut and devise an ambush strategy that would allow him to see and hear them before they approached him and would limit how quickly they could escape from him. A predator this intelligent, thoughtful, and meticulous haunts my nightmares and now I rarely stay in the woods overnight, especially unarmed. Thank you for enjoying Scary Bear Attacks. And before you go, I just wanted to tell you about a few amazing products in our merch store. Hit the trail with this I Love Scary Bear Attacks color-changing coffee mug, which changes colors based on the temperature of the drink inside of it and is a great addition to your camping equipment. Also, check out this I Love Scary Bear Attacks waterproof Bluetooth outdoor speaker. It's affordable and makes camping while taking our playlist along a breeze. Thanks again, and be safe, especially in bear country.